You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Mary Kay Andrews. Well, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show for you. Go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show any way that you download podcasts. You can listen to it there. I'd like to talk about some sponsors before we get started. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experience. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques, learn from a vast collection of free writing resources, Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.com. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've ever seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into that routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach those word count goals. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, Research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words. Stay for the fun. It's ForTheWords.com. That's the number four, TheWords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity, but it can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat-in-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours a day on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off our Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time with Rescue Time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Mary Kay Andrews on the show with me today. Mary Kay has a fantastic new release called Sunset Beach that is guaranteed to be uh, one of the best summer reads of the year. I'm I'm very sure of it. Uh, Welcome to the show, Mary Kay. Thank you, Hank. It's great to be with you. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, I, you know, probably I remember uh, as a child, um, someone gave me my first book that was just mine, and it was one of those big golden books, uh, uh, versions of um, Swiss Family Robinson, and I love that book. I made, you know, and I I made up my own stories about the Swiss family Robinson and living on an island. And um, from there, you know, I just um, love to write stories and read stories. And I was reading before first grade. So um, that's just sort of been the uh, arc of my of my life, um, (laughs) loving to read and wanting to tell stories, just kind of surrounded by stories. Yeah. Did your did your parents recognize this this love of stories and did they did they see the the storytelling gene in you do you think? Yeah, I I think that's probably true. You know, I grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida, and though a lot of people don't consider Florida the South, I do. And Southerners love their stories. 
and I grew up, um, my mother's family, um, all of my aunts and uncles lived there and my grandparents, and we would gather on Sunday afternoons at my grandparents' house, and, you know, the stories would get told around the dining room table, and um, my mother was a huge reader. She always had a book in hand, and I can remember um, there were, I was one of the second oldest of five, so she would take us to the, the uh, bookmobile when it came to our neighborhood. And each of us, I think, could fig- pick out maybe five books apiece uh, or maybe ten. But when we got off that bookmobile, the six of us, the tires would rise because we were all <laughs> loaded down with a maximum number of books. Oh, that's so amazing. My uh, my wife and I have five kids as well, and I'll tell you what, when we leave the library, the, there's a collective sigh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so what was what was your first foray into telling your own stories? Um, gosh, you know, uh, I played a lot of, I, you know, I, we played a lot of games when I was a kid. I had, uh, an older sister and a younger sister and the three of us would act out Nancy Drew. And then I would sort of script out Nancy's further, you know, adventures. Um, so, um, I can't remember a time when I wasn't telling stories. I majored in journalism, um, in college and, um, grew up on newspapers and, you know, I can remember I can remember watching Superman and I wasn't so I wasn't so fascinated with Superman I really wanted to be Lois Lane um cuz I wanted to be in a newsroom and I wanted to wear you know cool looking suits and cute hats and have a typewriter and flirt with Jimmy Olsen That's so funny uh and, and so uh Ironically, uh, last night, but when we're recording this, uh, I watched the original Superman uh, movie with Christopher Reeve with my oh, nephew yeah. and niece, and I was, uh, I, I loved that old newsroom feel. You know, there there were typewriters yeah. everywhere, and uh, um, you know, um, one the the editor who hired Clark mentions to Lois that uh, that one of the reasons that he hired him is he's the fastest typist he's ever seen. And uh, that was, you know, it was just such a nostalgia thing, and and the the joke completely went over every, you know, the the little ones' heads. But it was, right. uh, but yeah, yeah, Lois was a fearless reporter, and it just yeah. threw herself. And yeah, I, I love that aspect of that character as well. Um, at what point did you try your first novel? Well, I was working as a reporter, a features writer for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. And this was probably about 1988 or 89. I had two young kids, and I wanted to be home. Uh, I had loved, I had loved journalism for a long time, but it changed. And I, just as, as it was changing, and stories were getting, I think, dumber and shorter. <laughs> I wanted to write longer stories for a bigger audience, and so I started writing in secret. And um, I started writing a mystery and. Um, gave myself, I joined a writer's group with uh, other reporters in the newsroom and, and we would meet on Wednesdays. Um, we would meet on when or Thursdays, I guess we would meet. So Wednesday nights we would meet and we exchanged chapters and each would read the other's chapters and we would go to lunch together and talk about our books. And so I would write Wednesday nights and, um, I gave my um, of one year, and when I had when the year was up, I had written my first novel, and uh, it didn't sell. But it taught me that you know two important things: a that I could write a novel, and b how to go about um, selling my work. That's and that that is the confidence builder that nothing else uh, can give you. Just you, you know, going well for first off, you know, so many people say they they feel like there's a book in them. Uh, but but actually sitting down to do it and finishing it um, just gives you uh, gives you something that you can't get anywhere else. Right. Even though that book never sold, I, I right. wouldn't take anything for the experience of having having written it. It was it was my um, it was my internship um, for being a novelist. And um, as soon as I finished it and started sending it out, um, I got rejection letters, but I got nice ones. And I, um, I I started on my next novel right away. So, uh, you know, it was sort of like I had the bug and I was determined um, that I would see it through. And I think, you know, people always ask me for advice for, for writers. And I say, you know, just sit down and do it. Carve out time in your life 
um, my time for a long time, the, when I was still working full time, was Wednesday nights. I, I didn't have a computer at home. I didn't really even have a typewriter. I would put my kids to bed and I would sneak back down to the paper and I would write in secret on their computer, which was against company policy, which made me want to do it more. <laughs> I love talking to novelists that cut their teeth, so to speak, in journalism, um, because I think there's some interesting things that you learn as a journalist that that bleed over into fiction writing. Um, what are some of the things that you feel like you carried with you into fiction that that maybe you honed or uh, skills that you picked up uh, in in journalism? Well, learning to write on deadline was number one. Um, That's what you know, everybody um, says. Yeah. yeah. Well, a newspaper editor isn't waiting for the muse to strike you. They're standing <laughs> exactly. there with the handout. And I can remember back in the days when we did work on typewriters, electric typewriters, and literally there was someone there standing over your shoulder waiting to rip the copy off of your IBM Selectric. So you didn't have time to you know, worry about writer's block or inspiration or the muse. You just sat down and did it. And so that kind of that kind of um, understanding that there is a deadline and and that you know it has to get done whether you want it to get done or not. And then I think so many other skills. Really, when you're a, a reporter, you really have to listen when you ask when you're in, interviewing someone, and you have to observe not just what they're saying but how they're saying, and you really have to be attuned to those nonverbal signals that you're getting. Um, and you have to be attuned to the environment around you. You have to understand the setting because setting is, is so important even when you're writing nonfiction. It has, you know, that a setting is just a lot to do with the way people, people respond to questions and, and, and um, their behaviors. So um, writing down and really listening teaches you how to write dialogue. And I love to write dialogue. That's my favorite part of writing fiction is I like to listen to people. I, lis I love to listen to they if they speak in the vernacular. Um, I love to listen to their slang and kind of capture the essence of somebody that way. Um, and, and research. Um, I do a tremendous amount of research for my novels, even though they're fiction. So with Sunset Beach, that this book has a storyline that jumps back and forth between the present day and an old unsolved disappearance in the 1970s. So I had to go back in the 70s, and um, I went. The book is set in my hometown of St. Petersburg. So even though I grew up there, I you know, and I left when I got married in 1976. So I had to do research about um, what that place was in 1976, what it looked like, what businesses were there, what homes looked like. Um, it, part of that novel has some police procedural stuff. I had to find um, a, a, Saint, a former St. Pete police uh, officer who could talk to me about procedure back then, which I did. I tracked down, um, this was this was kind of bittersweet. I tracked down a retired St. Pete police de detective um, and um, I was talking to him about, you know, how did that work back in the 70s? Did you get a radio call? What would the signal number be for a domestic call? And um, I mentioned to him kind of casually, I said, you know, my uncle, my late uncle was a career um, police officer in St. Pete. And he actually retired as acting chief of police. And he said, well, what was his name? And I told him my uncle's name was Ray Moyamar. And he said, oh, my gosh, he was my boss. So oh, that's, that's one of those weird things, but you know the so having those that set of skills that you learn as a journalist, learning how to research, learning how to ask people strangers questions and sometimes tough questions, but listening very carefully to their answers so that you get things accurately. Um, those are all skills um, that I wouldn't have had if I if I hadn't um, cut my teeth as a journalist. That's one of my favorite answers uh, to that to that question that I've ever gotten. Um, people watching cannot be understated, can it? No, no, no. I mean, every place I go, I'm watching people. I'm eavesdropping. I'm terrible about eavesdropping. I'll be in a restaurant. In fact, I got a book idea, eavesdropping in a restaurant in Charleston years ago. <laughs> I great. was, they were, this woman was describing this terrible thing that had happened in her personal life. And I was busy um, writing notes on my napkin. <laughs> Love it. Love it. 
Um, I would think that, uh, like you said, writing uh, to deadline uh, is uh, is something that that affects you deeply. Um, but I, I love that you you kind of had to steal away time uh, to write, and that you looked forward to you know those Wednesday nights when you would get your chapters together and 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 that sort of stuff. That to me, it, it seems like helps you to to not. Uh, think of the writing process as too precious uh and that uh you know some people need to have the right um mood the right setting music playing or not music playing or complete silence or whatever before the muse hits them and uh and you really kind of have to learn to turn it on and turn it off don't you yeah i mean when i was a reporter i wrote stories um in the back of cabs i wrote stories uh, in the middle of a hurricane, I, you know, I would file stories. I would find a phone booth and write, have, you know, be scribbling my story on a steno pad and dictating it over the phone. So you, you learn that you don't have the luxury of waiting for the perfect set of circumstances. So, and, you know, even though um, I have an off, a, a nice home office and, and my husband and I are empty nesters, we don't have um, small children, we have grandchildren. But um, I still, I still, I can do that. I can turn it off. I can lock myself in my office. I, you know, when I'm on deadline, I put my laptop by the side of my bed so that in the morning I reach over and I grab my laptop and I attack my story before the day attacks me. Oh, that, I love that. I love that. Um, you began writing mysteries, as you said, and you right. have you have switched gears um sort of uh, with the the series mm-hmm. that you're uh, in the the types of books that you're doing now uh, sunset beach is is uh is a bit of a mystery and and a hybrid of sorts um what was the what was it that you loved about mysteries and then why did you ultimately switch to the types of stories that you tell now you know i'd always loved mystery i started out as a nancy drew kid and uh at those Sunday after those Sunday dinners at my grandparents, my grandfather would load up a, a brown paper sack full of Ellery Queen, paper Ma- uh, Perry Mason, and Mickey Spillane um, paperback, um, you know, dime novels, and I devoured those. I didn't understand a lot of what was going on in them, especially with the Mickey Spillane, which were pretty racy for the time. <laughs> But um, and then I became a um, Agatha Christie fan too. So I wrote what I I started out writing what I loved to read, which was mystery. And then I had an idea. I wrote a mystery series set in Atlanta, and there are eight uh, installments. That's a Callahan Garrity mystery series, and those are still in print. And I had an, then I had an idea for a different kind of book. It was set in Savannah. Uh, my series had been set in, Atl- in Atlanta, and it had a protagonist who was not a cop, and she was not an amateur sleuth. Um, and she owns um, – she's an antique dealer, and um, she finds a body in a house. And, of course, it turns out to be the, um, the mur- her ex-husband's mistress has been murdered. And um, she's the number one suspect. So I, I wrote that book, and I thought I was writing another mystery. And when I turned it in, my editor looked at me and said, this is not a mystery. Um <laughs> Oops. I said, or actually, she said, she said, you're not done. And I said, what do you mean I'm not done? I solved the mystery. And so I had a, I had, that book was about a woman whose life is upended and she has to figure out how to, how to save her own self. And, and she starts a new relationship. And my editor said, well, you solved the mystery, but you don't tell me what happens with the protagonist and her new love interest. So um, she said, you know, go back to, go back to your story and figure that out. And when I'd finished it, um, she said, we're not going to sell this as a mystery. We're going to sell this as a, as a, as, as straight novel, uh, a beach read. And so that's when I actually, you know, I'd been writing under my real name, which is Kathy Hogan Trocheck. Um, but that book was so different. Um, we decided to publish it under a pseudonym. So Mary Kay Andrews is a combination of my children's names. And um, that book, you know, it was, it was sort of a gamble, um, I thought I was writing another mystery, and then we decided maybe it wasn't. There is a mystery. There's a murder, but the really important story is not who done it, but how my how my character Wheezy Foley reinvents herself and how she finds herself and finds a new way for herself. So that seemed like a time uh, and a place to launch a new pseudonym, and um, 
you know, sort of, it was a gradual transition to women's fiction, beach books, whatever you call it, mainstream fiction. Wow. And as Mary Kay Andrews, am I right that this is the 26th um, book yeah, that you published? I think it's published? the 26th. I'm not positive. Um, wow. And then under... I have two... Yeah, well, I have two novels that um, the rights reverted to me, and so those are ebook only. So this is my 26th or 27th, and I wrote a cookbook two years ago, the Beach the Beach House Cookbook. Wow. And and total, I, I think you've written probably over 30 books, haven't you? Uh, maybe. <laughs> wow, that's... <laughs> I've written some novellas, too. Yeah. Which, you know, uh, most people's novellas are, uh, you know, a hundred pages or so. Mine are longer. Mine tend to be, you know, 150, 200 pages or more. So <laughs> just too much story to tell, isn't there? Absolutely. I'm yeah. always trying to shove 500 pounds of story into a 10 pound sack. Oh, that's so funny. That's so funny. Um, what you, you talked about, um, you as the writer were, were sort of confused in the beginning about, you know, you felt like you had done your job. You solved the mystery, right. yet there was more story there. To be told, um, when you're switching genre like that, even even when it's subtle uh, or, um, you know, it, it, to you, it, it's probably still the same story. It's just where, how far does the story go? Like how when you're switching hats like that, going between Mary Kay and, and the then your other um, stories that you tell, how do you get into that headspace to know what your job as the writer is in this situation? Well, I'm not really switching anymore. The books are... I'm writing beach books now. Now, I want to write a different kind of a beach book. You know, there are all kinds of beach books, women's fictions, and, and a lot of their, those stories are about women who are looking for new love or they're looking for a new job or they're looking for a great pair of shoes. My characters are looking to reinvent themselves. They're looking to figure out how, how life is going to go forward. And so that's... That's the puzzle that I'm trying to solve in my books. And and um, I guess because mystery and crime writing is kind of baked into my DNA, there's always, in all the novels, there's always been some kind of mystery involved. It might not be a murder every time, but there's some kind of a mystery, some kind of a conceit that my my protagonist has to unravel. And so, you know, part of my job as a writer is to figure out and my editor always asks me these three questions. Who is she? Because my females are predominant, my uh, protagonists are predominantly women. Who is she? What does she want? And what's stopping her from getting what she wants? And in the end, what can she do by the end of the story that she couldn't do at the beginning? So that's sort of the, those are sort of the boxes I need to check off as I'm, as I'm building a story arc for my character. Over the um, 26 or so books that you've written, um, has your writing process changed? Uh, maybe, maybe somewhat. I still start with a synopsis, and the synopsis just tells me and my editor and my literary agent what, it, what the story is, where it's set, who my character is, what her conflict is, and hopefully um, how the book, how her conflict will be resolved. And then I, you know, after the synopsis, I start the beginning and I just write all the way through to the end. Now, I do something a little different than a lot of my writer friends. My editor and agent are reading over my shoulder because I don't want to finish an entire novel and then find out that my editor hates it or that I've gone, you know, I've totally taken a different tack than what we had, what my editor envisioned. So I'm 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 submitting to them, you know, I'll I'll write 100 pages and ship it off to them and say what do you think? And my editor uh we've worked together. This is our 10th book together. So she knows me pretty well and she knows if she, if, if there's something that's not working, she'll point that out. Uh, if a character, you know, doesn't seem strong enough or if another, if a minor character is, you know, trying to wrestle the story away from my protagonist. I, I, and I like that. I like the instant um, gratification of knowing if it's going all right. So, um, and that's kind of been my way f- since the beginning. So probably my, probably my process hasn't changed that much. Um, I always, I always blow my deadline. Um, I, and I'm with someone <laughs> I'm someone who doesn't do a lot of drafts. 
and I think that's different than a lot of my writer friends. I write the book. I spit it out in one chunk, and um, I make it as polished as I can be. And then my editor reads it and gives me a revision letter. I make the revisions, and hopefully there won't be too many, but um, that's sort of how I do it. And it's not, I mean, every writer I know does things differently, but that's sort of my process. That process of sharing with your editor in the midst of the of the drafting yeah. would terrify most people. Um, but it sounds like you have a really great process that you've worked out. You're comfortable with it. You're, um, and it works for you. That's uh, that's amazing. I, I don't know anybody yeah, else who does to, it that way. You know, you have to have a level of trust. Yeah, I trust, and I've been so fortunate. I've had some amazing editors when I started out at Harper Collins. I had um, some wonderful editors there, and now I've been with St. Martin's Press for 10 books and 10 years with Jennifer Enderlin. And so we there's a level of trust you have to have, and I trust that we we both want the same thing. We want the best book possible. And so uh, when we will argue about things, she'll say, I don't think that's working, and I'll say – just give me some time. Let me see if I can work this out. Trust me. I have an idea of where this is going. And so, it, you know, it's very much of a give and take. And I like that. I like a collaborative process. Some people don't, but I like it. Well, it sounds to me like you're um, more of a discovery writer. You're discovering the story as you as you write it. Um, although you, you do start with a synopsis, so you, you know generally where the story's going. Um, it, it sounds like to me, um, but the, the sharing with your editor, I think, uh, probably, uh, a lot of people could benefit from having a little accountability in, in that way, because when you're discovering a story, sometimes it just goes completely off the rails and you wind up reworking those first, you know, 10 chapters over and over and over again, because you're, no one's there to tell you, you know, this is, this is just getting crazy. So. <laughs> right. You know, you know um, I, I don't know who said this, something about, you know, you write, you rewrite, um, you can rewrite that first page, that first chapter and polish it and polish it and polish it. Um, and you can spend a year doing that. But in the end, all you have is a polished chapter. You don't have a finished book. And, and so that's always at the top of my mind. Get the story down on the page. Get it on the page. And after you've spit it all out, then you can go back. I don't back up. And I tell beginning writers, that's my that's another of my favorite writing tips. Get the story down on the page. Spit it out. Don't back up. Don't polish yourself into oblivion. Because especially with uh, especially with new writers, you can you can you know, you can obsess about a chapter or a plot point until you you give up and you never move forward. And so, you know, I I sort of have, I should have this embroidered on a pillow in my office. You can't fix what you ain't wrote. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Well, it goes back to that, that first novel that you talked about writing and just the 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 gift it was to you, um, that even though it wasn't published, that you got from beginning to end. And I, I think a lot of people could really come up with a dynamic first chapter. Most people can come up with a great premise. You know, that's why we don't talk about we're, where writers get their ideas from because there are great ideas everywhere and and most people can really come up with a dynamite first chapter or two but what do you do after that you know that that's where the skill is is getting all the way through the thing and landing it yeah yeah i mean it's like running a marathon lots of people can start a marathon but to, you know until you cross <laughs> that finish line um you don't get the medal exactly Exactly. Well, let's talk about the new book, Sunset Beach. When people are hearing this, it's out everywhere, uh, hardcover, audio book, Kindle edition. Um, what's this book about, and, uh, and, and how, did it, uh, how did it start unfolding for you in the writing? Well, Sunset Beach is set in my hometown of St. Petersburg, so the book is really a valentine to my hometown and to my important landmark places of, of my my childhood, and uh, it's about uh, a, a young woman. Her name is Drew Campbell. She's been a professional kiteboarder, but she's had a career-ending sports injury. Um, and so she's at the beginning of the book. She's down. On, she's down on her luck. Um, she's out of work. She's been she's been waitressing in a beach bar, but she can't even do that. 
because of her um, knee injury. And um, she's at a crossroads. Her mother's died. Uh, she's broken up with her boyfriend. She's fixing to be homeless. And her father, long estranged father, um, shows up very unexpectedly at her mother's funeral. And he is a um, very flamboyant personal injury lawyer uh, on the west coast of Florida in St. Petersburg. And he offers her a job in his law firm. And he also gives her the very surprising news that she's inherited her grandparents' cottage on Sunset Beach, uh, where she spent lots of happy summer times. And that's her maternal grandparents. She doesn't even know her her mother inherited it after her parents' death, and she didn't even know her mother still owned it. So, And she has no relationship with her father um, um, since her teen years. She hasn't seen him or talked to him. So she very reluctantly, she doesn't have any other options. She she takes the lifeline he tosses her, moves over to St. Pete, moves into this beat-up, storm-damaged cottage on Sunset Beach and goes to work in the bullpen at his uh, law firm. And he's one of those lawyers that has the billboards and the bus benches and the TV and radio ads. So she's working in the bullpen on the justice line, answering the phone, and, you know, the, lots of those callers are, are grifters and con artists who are looking for a quick buck and a and a um, nice slip and fall settlement. And um, so she's, you know, oh, and the first day of work, she discovers to her horror that her father's new wife, who is also the office manager, is her junior high frenemy. Mm. So, yeah. A plot thickens. <laughs> Yeah, so there's some there's a ill-starred office romance, and um, you know she she's doing the job she has to do begrudgingly, and then a woman walks in, um, uh, a grandmother with a with a little girl, and um, she's unhappy with the law firm. Her her daughter has been murdered at a resort beach hotel, and the law firm has not gotten a settlement for her. So um, Drew finds something sympathetic in this woman's, um, um, in her conflict. And so she starts looking into this this um, unsolved murder at this beach hotel. And in the t- same time, she's fixing up her cottage. And one night she goes up into the attic because the roof is leaking and she finds a dusty file, and it turns out to be um, an official police file for a what turns out to be a um, long unsolved cold case disappearance in St. Pete. And she and her she can't figure out why it's up there, but she it seems to have something to do with her father. Her father was a, a police officer when in her very young childhood before before uh, he became a lawyer. And so she starts looking into this cold case disappearance, and her her doubts start to grow. Could her father be somehow implicated in this case? And so, you know, so what happens is there's two mysteries in this book, and they're woven they're woven through the book, and the book jumps time period. So you jump back to 1976 when this young woman disappears off a street corner in downtown St. Pete, and then to the present day where Drew is is you know trying to find her way in the world and trying to figure out who to trust. Um, and that book, and I, I, I was you know I, I give myself challenges with each book. That keeps it interesting for me as a reader. And I wanted to write this book with a little bit of a noir feeling. Um, yeah. So um, I wanted back to, to write that Mickey Spillane feeling a little bit. Yeah, or you know, um, one of my favorite sort of noirish movies is Body Heat. Yeah. which is also set in Florida with that steamy, humid Florida atmosphere. So that's sort of what I wanted to do. And and Sunset Beach was just a natural place to set this story. Um, when I was a teenager growing up in St. Pete, Sunset Beach was the place where hippies lived and hung out, and it was a place for oddballs and outcasts. And I actually had a cousin who came back from Vietnam. Uh, he was a Marine in Vietnam. And when he came back, as so many of those guys were, he was really changed. He came back with drug and alcohol issues. And he and his young wife lived in a in a garage, really, a rented garage on Sunset Beach. And I can always remember thinking that was so exotic. And, um, 
And so that's sort of one of the reasons why Sunset Beach is set where it is. Uh, what are some of the challenges when writing um, not only about a real place, but a place that uh, that's close to you and is, um, um, uh, you know, part of, of your history? Are there any things that you find yourself um, avoiding or maybe polishing up a little bit? Um, I, I, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I've tried to write yeah. stories about my hometown, and I'm always I'm always sp- catching myself kind of pulling punches a little bit or um i don't know do, do you find any challenges like that oh yeah i think um i i i try hard not to make my they're novel so it's not memoir but i did i deliberately allowed myself the the um luxury of writing about places setting scenes and places that were meaningful to me so for instance um there's a scene uh, that's set in a flashback in um, in a in a luncheonette, uh, Munches, which is a real place where my friends and I gathered for breakfast on Wednesday mornings before high school. Um, and there are there are scenes. There's a scene at a dive bar called Mastery's, which is the oldest dive bar in St. Pete. It's 84 years old. It's still open. In fact, we're going to have a launch party there for Sunset Beach next Wednesday. Um, and so I allowed myself to set set scenes at real places that were meaningful to me. The old cold case disappearance in the book, um, in, in that plot line, a young woman, she's a dental hygienist, and she goes, to, she goes shopping and to dinner with a co-worker and, uh, at a department store, um, which was, it was the big department store in St. Pete when I was a kid, Ma's Brothers. And I worked there as a teenager. I worked at Ma's Brothers, and um, my I bought my wedding dress there on layaway. And so I I gave myself, I indulged myself. So um, the woman's name is Colleen. She and her friend go to dinner and go shopping at Ma's Brothers, and she says goodbye to her friend, and she goes down. She leaves the store, and she she has I don't want to give any spoilers, but she has something that she plans to do. and she, But she literally disappears from that street corner uh, in front of Ma's brother. So um, I'm not writing about me. I'm writing, I'm putting my characters in a landscape that I know and love. But, you know, the challenge of it is, especially when you're writing a, a time period back in the 70s, I had to go back and research it. I, I mean, I had to say, okay, what street was that store on? And what did it look like? Fortunately, the Internet is full of stuff. So I could look up pictures of places. And so that that was, you know, a lot of fun. And, of course, the, that old cold case disappearance, this is another sort of indulgence on my part. It is inspired by a real um, cold case um, disappearance in Atlanta. Um, there was back in 1965, there was a... 22-year-old newlywed, her name was Mary Shotwell Little, and she went shopping at uh, a very popular Atlanta shopping center, Lenox Mall, and she disappeared, and she's never been seen again. And that is like probably the most notorious cold case in Atlanta history. And I, I wrote about it when I was a young reporter, it had, even though it had happened way before I came to Atlanta. I was so fascinated with it. Um, I wrote stories about, you know, what's ever happened with this case? Will they ever solve it? And so um, I thought, I had already plotted out this book, I thought. And then as soon as I started writing it, I thought, I've got to have, I've got to have this happen. I'm going to move this story. It's inspired by this story in Atlanta, but I'm going to move it to St. Pete and I'm going to make it my own. And, um, and and for me, the the story came alive once that, once that, plot began to um, be advanced when you're um, uh, all all the research that you're that you're doing for the book like you you talk about um, is that stuff that you do ahead of the writing Um, do you do you get to a point in the writing say oh I need to research this more Um, like how does how does that work do you do you get familiar with everything and then dive in or is it a, a work in progress with the drafting it's a work in progress. Like I'll start researching something. Um, you know, this book has a lot to do with a personal injury lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. Um, so I had to, I had to start, 
you know, finding personal injury lawyers to interview. I actually went to um, a personal injury lawyer law firm in Savannah. They're, you know, it's a big ambulance chasing law firm, and they have a justice line with a phone bank, um, people working in the bullpen. And so I sat in a bullpen and listened in on phone calls and, and you know, that talked to them about how the business works. So I, need, I knew that was going to be part of the plot. I knew I needed to figure out how that worked, how, how my character would do her job. But then as the plot advanced and I had this sort of switching back and forth in time, then I, then I had to go find out. I never know what I need to know until I'm right there. And I'll think, I don't know how that works. You know, I don't, I don't know um, the first mystery plot happens at a, at a resort hotel. Um, the murder victim uh, works as a housekeeper. So I had to go research how that, how that works. Gotcha. Um, how long does it take you to, uh, uh, to draft a book uh, like Sunset Beach? Um, uh, I, I know you, you said that you, you pretty much, you know, turn in a, a, a fairly clean draft. Um, is that a, uh, what's, what's the time frame like on a, on a book like that? Well, I write a book a year, and but I tour extensively and do a lot of promotional work and marketing work. So um, I leave for the road for book tour Monday, and I'll be gone for five weeks. So it's real hard for me to write on deadline, but I, I mean uh, on when I'm on the road. But now I have a book, next summer's book, summer 2020's book is due in October. So I've started working on it. I started working on it as soon as, 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 as Sunset Beach was in. So I've gone and done some research trips. I've started actually working on it and writing. Um, once I get home from, from um, the road in mid-June, it'll be pedal to the metal because that book is due in, in October. So the, the hardcore, intense writing happens in, unfortunately, somewhat of a compressed time. Right. And then you go through the editing process, and then, uh, then right. it's time to start storyboarding ideas for the next year? Right, absolutely. So I just, um, I guess in February, I signed a two-book contract, so I have two more books um, nice. under contract. And so, you know, summer 2020 is looming. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary Kay, the, the new book, Sunset Beach, uh, when folks are hearing this, is out everywhere. Um, hardcover, audiobook, Kindle, uh, ebook, however you read books, it's, it's out there. Um, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show My and pleasure. talk with us. Um, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into your massive back catalog and, and all of the great stuff that you're doing out there, is there a place they can connect with you online? Absolutely. They can check my website at marykayandrews.com and if they want to see what I'm up to um, on the hourly basis just about um, friend me on Facebook or follow me on Instagram okay. and you've got all kind of fun stuff on your website you could really spend some time there and, and, yeah, uh, I hope so. and learn a lot Yeah, Mary Kay uh, thank you so much we're going to send everybody to pick up their copy of Sunset thank Beach you. and to go uh, visit you on social media and on the website we've got links to it all in the show notes um, thank you so much for taking time to come my on my pleasure today. Hank great to be with you thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast for more great author interviews like this one go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives there's something there I know you'll love now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. I'm melting, I'm melting, cried Joey. Take the picture already. He stood with one arm around the bronze waist of the bewitched tribute statue, Samantha Stevens, riding a broom across a crescent moon. Jason tried in vain to frame the shot without any tourists in it, but that was impossible. From all points of the compass, a merry horde had arrived for Salem's two-day summer psychic fair. All the commuter trains had burst open, like cornucopias filled beyond capacity, spilling endless fruits and nuts onto the red brick sidewalks of Essex Street. A vampiress in lavender shorts and feathered boots sold maple chocolate walnut fudge in front of the Witch City Tattoo Parlor. A near-naked gypsy in purple-green veils danced with a pheasant in her arms around a plug-in Hanukkah menorah. A fat man in a fetching blue jeans dress sold amethyst and citrine charm bracelets in front of Medusa Cafe, 
but his stand got knocked over by a one-armed crone driving a mobility scooter who sang, Choo-choo! as she passed, her stump on the wheel, her lipstick ghastly, her gnarled right hand raised in trailing plumes of noxious cigarette smoke. Chewbacca leapt out of her way and slapped sparks from his fur. He gave a disgruntled growl before going back to playing summer lovin' on his ukulele. The old one-armed dervish drove off, choo-choo, parting a crowd of wanderers, slack-jawed tourists with camera straps tight across their bellies, yellow-vested police on segways, elderly rollerbladers, face-painted infants and harried parents, and college girls. So many hot, hysterical college girls that you'd think somebody had napalmed a sorority house. Jason, are you deaf? Sorry. Jason raised the phone and took the shot. Joey inspected the photo and nodded in approval. Your turn. No, thanks. Do it, Shaggy. Don't make me hex you. Jason gave in and traded places. He put an arm around Samantha's metal back. Her bronze body had flushed in the afternoon sun, warm through his glove, but her eyes were weary. No, downright creepy. And her smile was forced, like a Disneyland princess who'd had her toe stomped. Say chowder, cried Joey, who'd been practicing his New England accent all morning. Come on, man. Say chowder. Fine, chowder. Joey got the shot, and Jason surrendered Samantha to a chubby kid wearing a Gandalf beard who climbed up to worship her bronze bosom.